Perhaps you're wondering where you are. Well, you're now in my dimension, known as the other world. <laughs> oh my god, Lord Zed has access to the other world of Silent Hill? No wonder he looks so freakishly awesome. Though he must have hired an interior decorator or something at some point. This version of the other world looks pretty well lit and even has some decent foliage. Ladies and gentlemen and others, welcome to Season 2 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. The season begins with a three-parter, originally aired in prime time, no less, which has the main characters participating in a dirt bike race for charity. Say, you know what I did in high school? I was on speech team, I was in several musicals, I played violin. But you know what I didn't do? Dirt bike racing! I mean, what the hell is up with Angel Grove? We frequently see the teenagers doing every friggin' thing under the sun, and yet still have free time to work on homework, save the world, and simply hang out at the juice bar. Oh, and let's not forget the fact that they each teach their own classes at the juice bar, be it martial arts, dance, or gymnastics, and are working staff on charities. It astounds me that this is the conception of high school life that was presented to us. Nobody could do all this stuff just in their high school years. It simply doesn't happen. Anyway, Season 2 is where we're introduced to a new villain to replace Rita. There's only so much leverage you can get out of the same stock footage of these characters deciding to make monsters. And the instant you see our new villain, you know why people preferred him. This is Lord Zed, Emperor of Evil and Rita's boss. You'll recall that last time Rita was referred to as an Empress of Evil, so I'm not sure how one has a hierarchy when one is supposed to be the supreme ruler. What's even better is that we'll later learn that even Zed has a boss. But just look at this guy. This is what H.R. Geiger would create if he wanted to make a supervillain. Metallic exoskeleton surrounding exposed muscles, a red visor, tubes carrying fluid all over. Clearly he looks like a more serious threat than the sorceress who has the same fashion consultant as Queen Amidala. Plus, you can't fault his logic about why he's taking over again. Those Power Rangers are nothing but mere infants! You were defeated by children! You dare call yourself an Empress of Evil? You are not fit to destroy a cockroach! I have always said that, my lord! You gold-bellied rat! <laughs> you have made me very angry! As stated before, the show was running out of Sentai footage to use, so while they just started using Zord footage from a different Sentai series, Lord Zed was created purely as an American villain. He brings with him his own army of putties, silver ones with a Z emblazoned on their chests. However, that vanity of Zed's is the putty's downfall, since simply striking that Z will destroy them. Zed, to punish her for her failure, returns Rita to her space garbage can and tosses her out into the recesses of space, where I'm sure she'll never bother anyone again. Bulk and Skull's next stage of character growth begins here as well. After getting rescued by the rangers from Zed's putties, they decide they're going to try to figure out who they are under their helmets. I'll get more into it a bit later, but suffice to say, what raises my eyebrow is that for all their talk to the teens about how much they hate goody goods, they loudly proclaim their love and admiration for the Power Rangers. What also indicates a major shift in this season from the previous one is that, for the first time, we see the Rangers without their helmets on, but still in the suits. As a little kid, my jaw dropped seeing them like that. After all, it's taken them 61 episodes for them to show something like this. Though for the life of me, I can't figure out why, since they've had the suits before on the show in non-Sentai footage. And just to show the sheer level of seriousness this new situation brings, for the first time since Tommy got his power infusion, we see signs of his 
his powers failing, indicating that the temporary extension he got on the Green Ranger powers is starting to run out. Zed summons a monster called Parantus Head that freezes the monster's zords as they try to summon them, then takes control of the Dragon Zord and Tyrannosaurus Zord. Zordon explains that the only chance they have is to get new Thunder Zords transformed from the old ones. Billy and Trini create a device to jam Parantus Head's abilities, but Zed sends the Zords back into the Earth in the hopes of destroying them. But fortunately, they're able to save the Dragon Zord and use what's left of the old Zords to create the Thunder Zords. Say Zords that many times, it's really fun. Sadly, because of Tommy's lack of power, he can't support a new Zord, though of course the real reason was that there wasn't a matching Zord from the Sentai they got the Thunder Zords from. Anyway, to make a long story short, they decide it's time to can this bitch. Tommy, can this bitch! And defeat it. Lord Zed takes it well. I didn't fail, you slippery quit! You fail! You all fail! Just like you failed before! If it seems like I spend a lot of the plot analysis following Tommy, it's only because his character tends to cause the most change in the early seasons. Sure, the one-off episodes develop the characters somewhat, but Tommy losing or gaining his powers tends to be the only story that continually gets brought up and have any impact on the narrative. As such, more and more we see that Tommy's powers are running dry and Zed makes it a point to try to exhaust the Green Ranger powers, both to wipe the slate of all of Rita's failures, but also to just reduce the threat of the Rangers. However, a a running subplot that really went nowhere is Richie, a new kid in school who basically exists to give Trini someone to pine over. Well, to be fair, he also existed as a possible candidate for the identity of the White Ranger. Richie is quite possibly the blandest of any character on the show, with the only exception being the occasional one-off character. Sitting here, having watched every episode he's been in, I cannot recall a single thing he actually did did besides for stand and smile. Basically, he was eye candy for the female audience, though I can't imagine why they needed him for that when even Billy has a physique that male models would be jealous over. Back to the Tommy Oliver show featuring the Power Rangers, the subplot of his powers running out comes to a conclusion in Green No More, a two-parter where he finally loses them completely. Zed plans to drain what remains of the Green Ranger powers to fuel a crystal that powers his own gang of Dark Rangers. The Dark Rangers are actually a gang of five jackasses from the high school that even Bulk and Skull are afraid of. And this concept really ends up being a big letdown. Sure, in season one we saw putties transformed into evil versions of the rangers, but the promise of a group of rangers equally as dangerous as the team wouldn't come to fruition until Power Rangers in space, but we'll get to that. However, the point I would make with this concept is that once again, Zed is thinking more strategically and being a bigger threat. While Rita's mutant rangers were simply putties with some more enhanced abilities, they were pretty easily dispatched. Taking the five teenagers with attitude concept and twisting it on its head shows that Zed was truly a match for the team. It's a pity that when you actually see these doofuses in their dark rangers costumes, it doesn't invoke horror like looking into a dark mirror, but instead laughter at how ridiculous they are. I mean, just look at these things. It's basically a face mask with a red cloth mouth and eyes glued on. Some of them don't even look like they're on straight. Did they blow the budget designing Lord Zed and didn't have anything left over for these losers? I mean, come on, give him a spray-painted motorcycle helmet at least. Give me 300 bucks and I could make a more convincing costume. They don't even look like they fit right. Meanwhile, Tommy's power has been completely drained and he stands alone against Zed's monster, which moves at about the same pace as a slug, which is why Tommy, of course, can't get away from him. Right. And in fact, this monster, while strong enough to steal his powers and disable the Mega Thunder Zord, is easily rolled down a hill by a swift kick from Tommy because Tommy's just that much of an ass kicker. However, Goldar takes over and taunts Tommy a bit with a slideshow, obviously a punishment far worse than losing his powers. He demands that Tommy acknowledge him as his superior, leading to this. Say it! You are... This... God! Out of your mind! This Tommy 
Johnny re-enters Zed's dimension and shatters the crystal, restoring enough of his powers for one last battle and getting the Dark Rangers out of their ridiculous outfits. To make a long and confusingly dumb battle short, they beat the monster and there's a trite, ludicrous wrap-up with the jackass teens, who apparently only needed friends to stop being assholes. Because that makes so much sense, especially since they're all supposed to be friends in the first place. If it seems like I'm being harsher on this one, it's only because as a conclusion to the Green Ranger story, it feels very rushed. There was a ton of build-up throughout the season leading up to this two-parter that has enough ideas in it to last for a three- or four-part story, but instead wasn't a satisfying conclusion, especially with the possibility of never seeing Tommy again. Some good follow-up comes a few episodes later with Jason lamenting the fact that if he had gotten the green candle last season, Tommy would still have his powers. Zed, striking inspiration once again, creates candles for the other four rangers, though why he doesn't make one for Jason escapes me, to drain their powers as well. Of course, this doesn't make any sense, given the explanation for how the candle drained Tommy's powers after having touched it and blah blah blah, but it makes for drama. Jason defeats the Monsters of the Week and then saves the other Rangers, and Tommy writes a letter to Jason telling him to not worry about it. While I will say that Tommy's development came at the expense of most of the other Rangers, it did set up an excellent story arc that could keep the viewers coming back, and the next stage of that was the two-parter White Light. Kimberly gets a letter from Tommy that says that he's coming back, and at the same time, Zordon and Alpha miss mysteriously vacate the command center. Also, Rita's trash can lands back on Earth. I guess Zed's got a really bad pitching arm considering he was trying to send it to the farthest reaches of the galaxy. Bulk and Skull find it and take it back to their workshop to try to get it open, hoping that it'll reveal the secrets of the Power Rangers. After getting defeated by another of Zed's monsters, who's able to split into three different beings, Billy locates the secret entrance to a hidden chamber of the command center and discovers that Zordon and Alpha are constructing a new ranger. He tells the others, and while at first aghast that it was kept from them and they don't know who the new ranger is, they eventually realize that Zed is a much worse threat than Rita and has consistently shown that they need the help. So Zordon and Alpha bring them back and show them the White Ranger, who unmasks to reveal Tommy. This is one of the best scenes in the show's history, and while while it's very simple, it's handled with the grandiose nature that it deserves. Tommy is given a new weapon, the Sword Saba, who can even speak to him, and that he'll be piloting the White Tiger Zord. They, of course, make quick work of Zed's monster and put Rita back in her garbage can before she can tell Bulk and Skull who the Power Rangers are. They send her back into space so she'll never be a threat again. Making Tommy the White Ranger was once again a stroke of genius for the writers. They could advance his story, make him a permanent part of the cast, and the White Ranger costume, while taken from a different Sentai series than the one Power Rangers was originally based on, looked similar enough to match the show. Plus, his Zord was from the Sentai that the Thunder Zords were from, so they didn't have to keep relying on the same reused stock footage all the time. And they finally got a shield for him that wasn't made of cheap cloth. Zed also reveals the nature of the morphing grid a bit more, saying that it's maintained by the balance of good and evil fighting one another, or in particular, he and Zordon. Huh, how very Joss Whedon-esque. However, shortly thereafter, a different subplot begins. There's some international peace conference, and they're looking for three teenagers with attitude to represent... Uh, the Angel Grove, I guess, at the conference. The group ponders briefly the all-too-real possibility of what would happen to the team if they were chosen to go to it. In building to that, there's a three-parter called The Ninja Encounter, centered around three new characters, Adam, Aisha, and Rocky. They're from Stone Canyon, the neighboring city to Angel Grove, and are going to be facing off in a ninja tournament against three arrogant ninjas. However, there's one thing in particular I have to point out, because it's a combination demonstration of something awesome, but also of just how ludicrous this show can get. There is a full three-and-a-half-minute sequence of a baby carriage going down a hill. Bear in mind that the average episode of Power Rangers, counting both theme song and ending theme, lasts about 20 minutes. A good chunk of the episode has now been devoted to this sequence, and it is the most absurd thing I've ever seen. First of all, this must be the biggest hill in the country, because the stroller goes downhill the entire time. Secondly, I don't care how big this hill is. A stroller and the cheap wheels on one simply don't have enough mass or torque to go fast enough that these 
teens at the peak of physical health can't catch up to it. And even if it somehow did, it goes into the grass. It would slow it down immensely. Speaking of the grass, my next point. The editing on this sequence is terrible. They don't even try to speed up the carriage footage to make it look like it's going faster than it is, making it even sillier that nobody can catch up to it. And when it does go into the grass, they often cut to the front of the carriage so we can see the baby inside. And the fact that it's still on the pavement. Fourth, the people of Angel Grove are apparently the dumbest pack of nitwits ever to inhabit a town. People keep jumping out of the way of the carriage, even when everybody's screaming for them to stop the carriage. I could put my foot in front of it and stop it. What are they afraid of, that the carriage will run them over? Plus, there's the fact that nobody seems willing to try and help except for a bunch of teenagers. Hell, an older couple doesn't even look up when people keep jumping all around them. This really paints a picture about this city. The teenagers are the only competent people living there. Let's face it, it's a very long time before before we finally see a police officer in the town, the military never steps in to fight the monsters. It's expected that the Power Rangers will do it for them, and they're the only ones to help out with charity and general cleanup. My God, these people deserve to be destroyed by Zed. Oh, and just to top off the absurdity, they only finally reach the baby, who is about to go over a hilly cliff, by doing complicated flips that would more likely just slow them down as get them in close enough. But as I said, there is in fact one good thing about this sequence. When it passes by Bulk and Skull, while Skull reacts with the same stupidity as the rest of the citizens of Angel Grove, Bulk takes one look at the stroller, realizes what's happening, and chases after it. He doesn't say he wants a reward. He doesn't he doesn't say it to trick someone, he doesn't need to be guilted into it. He sees a child in danger and he leaps into action. I'll get into that more when we talk about Bulk and Skull for this season. Anyway, the three teens get kidnapped by Zed to make them work for him. They work on escaping while the Rangers fight stock footage. Okay, this three-parter really drags, made no better when the team keeps having to be called back and forth trying to rescue the three. More or less, they discover the Rangers' identities and we learn that Jason, Zack, and Trini are the teenagers selected to go to the peace conference. Although, are you really surprised? The teens are responsible for every public's works project in this city. So that's all it takes to get rid of three Power Rangers! We're also introduced to Tor, the Shuttle Zord. Tor can protect the Zords, and in a pinch, join with the other Zords to land and crush a monster. I'm dead serious here. Yeah, Tor wasn't used that often. Conversely, Zed reveals that he can always one-up the Rangers with the introduction of Serpentera, a gigantic Zord that could devastate an entire planet when fully charged. Its primary weakness was that it apparently only runs on three AAA batteries, so its power runs out pretty quickly. In order to make sure that Zed doesn't strike with Serpentera while the three are at the peace conference, the Rangers travel to a deserted planet to retrieve the Sword of Light, with which they can transfer the powers of the three Rangers to Adam, Aisha, and Rocky. Zed travels in Serpentera after them to make sure they can't transfer the powers, though one wonders why he doesn't just use Serpentera to annihilate the Earth in their absence. So they manage to get the sword just before Zed completely destroys the planet and the transfer occurs. I don't think there's been a real official reason for why the three left the show, but most report that it was over money. In fact, all the episodes that feature Rocky, Adam, and Aisha are basically stock footage of Jason, Trini, and Zack, and really bad dubbers. I especially love the Trini dubbers, who always sound like a stereotypical Asian woman who can barely speak English, while Thuy Trang always spoke perfect English. The three new teens, well, they pretty much filled the roles that they replaced. Don't get me wrong, they were good choices. Unlike the guest stars who would either be wooden or overact, these three were very convincing in their parts, though I kind of liked them better when they weren't rangers. Knowing the identities of the others while still being helpful allowed them to really show their stuff and give credence to the idea that even ordinary people could achieve what the rangers did. There were some cosmetic differences. For example, Adam wasn't exactly teaching hip-hop Aikido in his classes. Aisha fills in Trini's role of best friend friend to Kimberly, and, well, that's it. I will say that what may have been a subtle touch with these three is that in the early episodes with them as rangers, we'd often see them together since they were already friends, and the other three rangers were together in their own group. As time went on, there was more mingling between the six. As time went on, Zed started to resemble Rita more and more in terms of his strategies. Sure, on occasion, there was some innovative thinking, like turning the planet back in time to before the teens became rangers and making them children, but he started making bad jokes and simply saying that we'll get them next time, blaming 
blaming his minions for the failures of his monsters. Which was sad. Zed was supposed to be this badass villain, yet he was getting punked by the teenagers on a regular basis. He hadn't had a real victory since the Green Ranger powers were lost. A three-parter, however, came in near the end of the season to shake things up a bit. Rita Repulsa returned once more, but this time she had a real plan. The teens are on a trip to Australia while Zed goes into a deep sleep to rejuvenate himself. Rita lands back on the moon and contacts Finster, getting him to restore her to her proper size. She gives herself a makeover on the pretense of making herself look young again, when really it's just to actually give her an actress for the non-Sentai footage. They use the putties to plant a disc inside Alpha 5 to make him evil, and I've gotta say, I think I prefer evil Alpha. He's openly insulting Zordon and cracking jokes. He's just a hoot, and I've got to imagine the writers were just having a blast with this episode. Evil Alpha makes the Rangers teleport to an abandoned theater in Angel Grove where their powers will be limited. The second phase of Rita's plan is a love potion that she puts into Zed's tubes, making him fall in love with her. Finster, in the meantime, recreates old monsters to send into the theater to attack the Rangers. While the Rangers try to find a way out of the theater, the wedding ceremony is prepared and Alpha teleports Bulk and Skull to the outback. Goldar is, of course, incredulous about the whole thing. When they do finally escape from the theater, they fight some stock footage before Alpha teleports them right back again. Most of the monsters go to attend the wedding, leaving two monsters who are easily defeated with the power of a net. Rita and Zed go off in Serpentera while Goldar leads the remaining monsters in a charge against the escaping rangers and the command center. After freeing Alpha from his reprogramming, the rangers bring out their zords to fight an army of stock footage. This is really a disappointing fight, highlighting the problem of not having the zord suits. We finally have an all-out brawl against several giant monsters, and it's all clearly from different sources. So the monsters are defeated, and Zed and Rita bicker. Now, people have criticized the marriage of Zed and Rita, but I'll give my thoughts on that next time. However, I would like to point out this very fun bit from an episode where Zed wants to make Kimberly his queen. Yeah, I'm not sure whose idea that was either. And Goldar tries to put her under a spell to do such a thing. And whose outfit does she end up in? Rita's, of course! Let's watch the fun! Oh, that gold coat thinks his spell worked. Okay, I'll show him. Queenie! Deep on the wrinkles! I did not better! Uh, what are you looking at? Uh, nothing, you're... Your Highness! You fine! Your instruction will now begin. Kneel to me as your master teacher. Forget it! You to be kneeling to me! Oh, I like your And as for you two... She's a lot like me, isn't she? Oh, you Maybe this was a bad idea. For once, my spell worked too well. Hmm. So Zed's ideal mate is... Rita. Huh. The marriage was done because of complaints the show had received from parents about how frightening Zed was to their children. Then again, he's a villain, so he's supposed to be frightening, so I'm not sure what they were expecting. The rest of the season is pretty much multi-parter, so I'll just give my brief thoughts on each. Return of the Green Ranger has the fight that really had to happen at some point. An evil clone of Tommy made into the Green Ranger to fight the White Ranger. What drags it down is that the rest of the Rangers are sent back in time to the late 1700s. It's not particularly convincing. I can't really put my finger on why. There's just this sense of cheapness I get from looking at it. Maybe it's the fake British accents. Compounding matters is the stock footage of the Dragon Sword, the last time we'll ever see it in action. Though the fights between the Green and White Rangers are fun, the clone of Tommy, after turning good, is left in the 17th century with his powers intact. More on that in a minute. A standalone between the multi-parters is best man for the job. The main plot is pointless, aside from some genuine amusements. Let me handle this before you get hurt. Huh, you all right? Yes, me, you arrogant airhead. No way. Back here! How dare you walk away from me when I'm talking? Typical, typical Tommy's lost headed behavior. Who's a blockhead? You're out of your mind. You can't take competition. You're not competition. 
competition for oh, me. Oh, am I more than you can huh. handle? And I'm going to win that uh, election. Go back to the mall. Excuse me. I'm talking to Mr. Runner up here. This you know. I'll tell you what. Storybook Rangers is a two-parter that really should have just been one. The only thing that saves it is, of course, Bulk and Skull. Wild West Rangers, however, expanded upon some previously established story ideas. Zed and Rita send a monster back in time to try to annihilate Angel Grove before the Rangers ever came around. Kimberly's teleportation signal gets trapped in the time hole and she gets sent to Angel Grove during the Old West. Naturally, the Rangers' ancestors look exactly like them with similar names. Although a nice touch is that the White Stranger that is Tommy's ancestor, has a green stripe in his hat. Though what does stretch the premise thin is Ernie's Juice Saloon. I'm sorry, but a Wild West town would not have a juice saloon. Also, I'm surprised no one accuses Kimberly of being a prostitute given her clothes. Oh, it is a kid's show. Strangely, there doesn't seem to be a Kimberly equivalent in this town until the very end. As established in the first season, the command center has been standing for thousands of years, so Kimberly is able to teleport there and get help. In a nice nod to continuity, Kim establishes that while Rita may have the Green Ranger coin, they still have all the other power coins. What's nice about this is that Rita and Zed have established in previous episodes that Zordon has created Power Rangers before, and this is such an instance. Amusingly, Zordon says this about the pink power coin. Too much pink energy is dangerous. I'll let that speak for itself. She gives the coins to the ancestors of her friends, which, while I'm sure makes sense to her, makes no sense from an actual logic standpoint. Her friends in the future have studied martial arts because of the people they are and the time period they're from. In the past, the teens are not martial arts experts. So yeah, they defeat the baddies, history is flushed down the toilet, and Kim goes back to the future. The season, however, does not end on a high note. Instead, it's a standalone where a statue of Billy made by Billy Love Interest number 17 gets turned into an evil copy. Subsequently, this is like the fifth or sixth time that we've either had Billy turn evil or have an evil duplicate. And it's like the 80th time that one of the team has acted strangely and yet the Rangers don't immediately seize upon the idea of, say, maybe this is part of Rita and Zed's plan. The episode frankly feels like it's from earlier in the show and really not worthy of ending out the season. Bulk and Skull's subplot about finding the Rangers' as true identities grows them in a rather subtle manner. In the first season, well, they were idiots through and through. They could barely read, they got detention constantly, but then again, Angel Grove High is some sort of totalitarian state where getting bad grades somehow lands you detention, and I'm being dead serious here. And they'd constantly find ways to make complete asses of themselves, even if they were entertaining ones. Whereas here, while their bumbling nature remains, a good chunk of the plans they come up with to find the true identities of the rangers are actually pretty damn clever. It's basic forensic science. They get footprints, they get recordings of the rangers' voices, they stage attacks. Well, okay, this one's not so clever since they can't duplicate the look of any monsters or the putties, but the fact that they thought of it shows some higher level thinking. Hell, while most episodes it's Bulk who comes up with the plans to find the rangers, there's one episode where Skull has actually done research and correlated the data to figure out who would be a ranger. Mind you, this leads them to the incorrect conclusion of Ernie being a ranger, but it shows them going above and beyond the call of duty and what was expected of the characters' intelligence to solve the mystery. It shows that the two aren't just one big punchline about how being a bully is wrong. In fact, most of the time, the reason their plans fail isn't because the plans are bad, but because the rangers screw them over. For example, in the aforementioned footprint episode, they manage to get a cement cast of the footprints, but the rangers make everyone in the juice bar go out onto the dance floor and a smack by Skull makes Bulk drop the cement block, shattering it. There's also an instance where they found a videotape that was recording while the rangers fought in the park, capturing their morphing as well, and while they stupidly don't watch the tape themselves first, the plan is foiled because the rangers, dicks that they are, take the tape away and switch it out. And frankly, the Rangers' behavior during it makes them out to be the bigger bullies. Remember, they could just reveal to the two who they really are and get them to stop. Now wouldn't that have been an interesting twist? Instead of having to figure out who the Rangers are, they instead have to cover for the Rangers, be their secret ally, and take the fall for them. That would present some interesting story opportunities, like the two becoming resentful of the Rangers, who get all the success and fame while they have to clean up their messes. Hell, take it a step further with their character development, and make the two realize what jerks they've been, that for all their bullying behavior, they've accomplished nothing with their lives, while the goody goods that they've always insulted ended up becoming superheroes. But still, for what did happen with the two, we got to see some different sides to Bulk and Skull here. 
Last time I talked about their true nature shining through, that for all the selfish behavior the two display, they do in fact have aspirations of being good guys. In this season, we see that taken a step further, and two incidents that really made me love these characters. The first was the part I mentioned from that idiotic chase scene for the baby, where Bulk instantly wanted to help after realizing what was happening. The second... Well, let me just tell you something. Countdown to Destruction is considered by many to be Bulk and Skull's finest moment, but there is a very close second for me that no one ever seems to bring up. In the episode, When is a Ranger Not a Ranger?, a monster scrambles the memories of the Rangers. Bulk and Skull, during a stakeout in a field, spot the teens teleporting in and morphing, learning their true identities. You can just see the wheels turning in their heads as they realize they've been played all this time. After the monster finishes off the rest of the rangers, the two spot prisms that the rangers plan to use to restore their memories. And for the first time in two years and 91 episodes, Bulk and Skull don't run away from a monster, but stand up and face it head on. Not so fast, buckaroo. What? Who said that? Who are you? Whoever you are, you are powerless to stop me from taking these captives back to the moon! You're not taking the Power Rangers anywhere! What? Yeah. Not if we can help it. Which I hope we can. Don't force me to destroy your minds as well! Draw! You yellow-bellied skunk. Oh, very well, Earthlings! If you insist on orchestrating your own doom, we will have what I believe you call a showdown. <laughs> so yeah, they may have lost their memory about who the Power Rangers are, but it was the comic relief duo that saved the day. It was at that moment that I realized how awesome these characters really are. After all, it's one thing to be brave when you've got powers, good looks, and the uncanny ability to do 15 things at once and be loved by all. It's an entirely different matter to be the underdog, not the smartest or best in shape, and still stand up to evil. Hot damn these two rock. While the Trini and Richie subplot went nowhere, Tommy and Kimberly moved closer together and cemented the fact that they were in a relationship. We'd see them frequently going on dates, exercising together, and buying gifts for each other. Hell, on more than one occasion, the two kissed. They really had good chemistry together, and I'd like to think that they ended up together, despite some stuff we're going to be seeing in later seasons. What seems to be a recurring theme, in the early episodes at least, is Zed continually trying to pull the Rangers apart. Later, a good number of his plans revolve around creating his own team of evil rangers to fight off the team, though that would go pretty much unfulfilled sadly. He really seems to have a thing for mind control too. As time went on, the plans became less elaborate, but still menacing at times. The addition of Serpentera to his arsenal guaranteed a permanent lingering threat, but its lack of power in its energy banks gave it a keen Achilles heel. While Rita's monsters were crafted, Zed's monster style matched his overall strategy when dealing with the rangers. He would pervert something good or innocent and turn it evil, also investing a a personal stake in the rangers that the transformed object was something that mattered to them. That meant that the rangers would frequently worry about combating the monster without damaging the things they cared about. This season also continued the theme of magic versus technology. Frequently, Billy's devices would be implemented in order to fight Zed's spells or the monster's abilities. Zed was obviously a more adept magic user than Rita. While Rita needed to invoke incantations and ceremonies to cast spells or summon some monsters, Zed's spells and powers could be utilized with either a single phrase or just by willing it to happen with his staff. It's easy to see why Rita was easily intimidated by him and was lower in the food chain compared to his power. Also, Rita's plans tended to fall more on the petty side of things. For example, there was an episode where Kimberly was working on a model of a float to promote peace on Earth and all all that junk. Rita sends down a squad of putties to wreck the model of the float so that the real float can't be built. Yes, she sends her stormtroopers down just to make Kimberly feel bad. Zed, conversely, simply used the teenager's situations to inspire him on new monster designs and how to split the team apart and destroy themselves. He had the goal of conquest and directly saw the Rangers' continued existence as an obstacle to overcome. His failure to defeat them was also a constant reminder of Rita. Bear in mind that he disposed of Rita because of her failure, and seeing that he wasn't doing any better must have been quite the blow to his ego. After all, he 
He's the Emperor. He shouldn't have to dirty his own hands in dealing with his enemies. However, as we'll see next season, he would have been a force to be reckoned with if he had ever directly engaged the Rangers. If I could describe the season in a single word, it'd be change. While this season had plenty of filler, the status quo had more of a chance to get shaken up. From the start of the season, when Lord Zed arrives, to Tommy becoming the White Ranger, to the power transfer, to Rita's reintroduction, things were definitely changing. The show was relying less and less on Sentai footage, but that also meant they were running out of Sentai footage to use. Change would come even more substantially next season. Meet me in the hallway after school. We have what you've been looking for. I found that in my locker. Do you know what this means? Somebody knows the combination to your locker. 